All right, why don't we go ahead and get started since it's 1045 on the session L20B concrete filled hollow structural sections. And before I actually begin, I do want to thank you all for surviving to the last session before the keynote on the last day. So I appreciate you all showing up and I appreciate all of you that are watching this um, over the internet. Hopefully uh, you get something out of it. So like I said, this session's L20B on concrete filled hollow structural sections. The all-important PDH code for this session is 66782. So that's 66782. And I'll repeat that at the end of the session. So my name's Jason McCormick. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. And I got asked to do this presentation largely because of some of the work that I do and research that I do on hollow structural sections and hollow structural section connections. But this presentation is mainly going to focus on design aspects of concrete filled hollow st structural sections and really focus on what's in chapter I and how you can use that in order to design these members and take advantage of these members in your structures. So like any good educator, we're gonna start off with some learning objectives as in regards to this session. So we wanna look at describing the advantages of concrete-filled hollow structural sections. Then we'll explore the design of concrete-filled hollow structural section members under axial tension and compression, shear, flexure, and combination of axial compression and flexure. Then we'll look at some practical implications of using concrete-filled hollow structural sections. And then I'm gonna finish up with a slight discussion of some of the research that I've been doing recently looking at other alternative fill materials for HSS, mainly for seismic applications. So in general, we'll go through an overview, look at section classification for concrete filled hollow structural sections, look at the analysis methods that are mentioned in chapter I, look at the design requirements that are in chapter I, consider some practical implications, and then like I said, finish up with the research. So I think most people, when they think of composite construction, they automatically go to beams composite with the concrete floor slab. And that's been around since 1935. But the other side of things is concrete filled tubes or, or column sections that are composite. And these have been used less in the United States. And you can see that based on the fact that they weren't adopted into the LRFD specification until 1986, and then the ASD specification until 2005. But the reality is these types of members, these concrete filled hollow structural sections are used worldwide a lot, just not here in the United States. So you see them used in Japan, China, Australia, Europe, but we really haven't taken full advantage of them here in the, in the US. And the reason why they've gained popularity elsewhere is there's been significant advances worldwide in the last 20 years due to a lot of the research that's been done. And some of that research been, has been done here in the US, but a lot of it has been done outside of the United States. Now, if we're talking about concrete filled hollow structural sections, we're talking about members that have, are made up of two components. The first obviously being the steel component or the HSS member. So square rectangular around HSS members. And then the internal portion is the concrete. The concrete can be unreinforced or reinforced. But if you're considering a hollow structural section and considering the typical sizes for hollow structural sections, oftentimes you're gonna see this as unreinforced unless you get to larger sections which would allow you to fit the reinforcing in there. You're gonna use either normal weight or lightweight concrete, but you do have the options of looking at high strength steel fiber reinforced or self-compacting. And you might use a self-compacting concrete if you have uh, the HSS member with internal reinforcement because that'll allow you to ensure that you, you're able to fill the voids. And the combination of these two components allows you to take advantage of the composite action between these two materials. And this is beneficial under a variety of different loadings, whether it be static, impact, blast, seismic, or fire loads. So just to give some definitions to start off, for a typical HSS member, B and H or A are your outer dimensions for a rectangular or square section. And then B sub I and H sub I are gonna be your internal dimensions on that. Now the other thing that I wanna point out is the internal radius of the HSS section. And the reason why I wanna point that out is if you're calculating local slenderness ratio, you're gonna use that value as 0.75 times the wall thickness of the tube. But if you're doing any other calculations, such as for area, section modulus, or moment of inertia, you're gonna take that value as one times the thickness of the tube. 
And then if you look at a round section over there on the right, you get a little easier dimension to just have the outer diameter, the inner diameter, which we'll take as h sub i, and the wall thickness. So why consider using concrete-filled hollow structural sections? Well, there's a number of advantages, right? It's gonna eliminate the need for form work, right? The tube itself is gonna actually act as your form for the concrete. You have increased column and beam capacity, that's, which obviously can be helpful. You have increased stiffness as a result of the concrete being within that tube. That increased stiffness can uh, result in smaller deformations, which could be important for impact or blast type loadings. You have increased ductility, which is important for, from a seismic standpoint or any time you're looking to go inelastic. And then increased fire resistance. Now this can lead to a reduction in the amount of external fire protection that you actually need and a decrease in cost. You can also have increased connection strength, but I mentioned that possibly because that's a function of the type of connection and the configuration of the connection that you're using. So all this can lead to reduced HSS sizes, so reduced costs on your steel side, and protection for the concrete, and this is again important in terms of if you're looking at impact or blast type loadings. There are some disadvantages. You need to account for shrinkage in the concrete. If you're assuming that you're able to load the concrete directly in the internal portion of the tube, that may have shrunk and you may not actually be bearing directly on the concrete, so you need to account for this in terms of designing that, the detail for that, how that load's transferred into the member. There's also a lack of knowledge in regards to the mechanical bond between uh, the steel and the concrete. There hasn't been a significant amount of research in that area, although some research has shown that for flexural loads, that bond, if you have a loss of that bond, it really does not affect the moment strength. So it's a disadvantage, but it's not a significant disadvantage. And then you need to have some coordination between the trades. And one thing that I didn't put up there is one possible disadvantage is your connection design. You need to be careful, particularly if you have a reinforced hollow structural section, uh, concrete filled hollow structural section, because say you were gonna do a through plate connection and you have reinforcing run through it, right? you have to somehow uh, rectify the, the problem there. Now, if we consider the materials that are involved, obviously the steel HSS members, the available grades that we have are ASTM A500 grade B and C, ASTM 1085 grade A. The thing to keep in mind in terms of the HSS members is your minimum yield strength for your strength calculation has to be taken as less than 75 KSI. And reinforcing bars, the other side of the steel component, here you're looking at typical reinforcing bar grades. Oftentimes you're gonna see a grade 60 bar used. And again, like with the HSS members, we have a minimum yield strength that we can use for our strength calculations and that has to be less than 80 KSI. Now, if you've gone to one of the earlier presentations that Kim Olson discussed, she discussed some of the uh, grades that are available for hollow structural sections. And one thing to keep in mind if you're designating a hollow structural se section is that most mills now produce dual grade BC product. So if you're specifying a hollow structural section, you're better off specifying grade C product because you're probably getting that anyway. And then you can take advantage of the, the slight extra that you have in terms of the yield strength and tensile strength. But also keep in mind that if you're dealing with a hollow structural, uh, A500 hollow structural section, your design wall thickness, you need to take that as 0.93 times the nominal wall thickness because of the plus or minus 10% tolerance on uh, the dimension. Now you could go ASTM A1085. This has tighter tolerances than the ASTM A500 and also has a mass tolerance, has toughness requirements, and it requires your yield strength to be between 50 and 70 KSI. And because of those tighter tolerances, in this case, you can actually take advantage of the full thickness and use the nominal wall thickness in your calculations. Now on the concrete side of things, you're looking at normal weight or lightweight concrete. So for normal weight, it's gonna have to be between three KSI and 10 KSI concrete. For lightweight, it's between three KSI and six KSI. Now that 10 KSI limit is mainly there because there's not a lot of research that's been done with concrete filled hollow structural sections with higher strength materials. And also some of the research that has been done here in the US has shown that that 10 KSI strength is kind of a boundary where you start to see a different behavior occurring after that point. And because of that, the chapter I equations may not necessarily apply. 
Also, in general, these limits for the concrete tend to limit, uh, encourage good quality, readily available grades of structural concrete. All right, so that's just a kind of a general overview and some information in terms of uh, concrete filled hollow structural sections. Now we can look at actually how we classify the sections. And we have to worry about local buckling still, and we're going to still classify these similarly to how you would do a, just a hollow structural section member, where you're going to look at the element slenderness ratio for local buckling and consider the width thickness, depth to thickness ratio, or diameter to thickness ratio, depending on whether you have square, rectangular, or round. Now, unlike what we currently do now for a beer, beer steel product in that if you're looking under axial compression, you're looking at the boundary between non-slender and slender, for both axial compression and flexure, we classify a concrete-filled hollow structural section as compact, non-compact, or slender, okay, based on that lowest element slenderness ratio. Now, the, the other thing to keep in mind in terms of local buckling is that the concrete infill does actually change the buckling mode, both within the cross section and along the length of the member. So you can see here, for a typical hollow structural section, what you end up seeing is two of the walls tend to move outward, two of the walls tend to buckle inward. And as a result, you get this S-type shape or reverse curvature shape along the length of the member in terms of its buckling. Whereas for a concrete filled section, because you have that concrete that resists that wall moving inward, all the walls end up buckling outward, like you see here in the figure. And you can see you get more of an hourglass shape in terms of the uh, buckling along the length of the member. In this, this buckling mode tends to lead to a slight increase in the moment of inertia and some more stable post buckling behavior that you can take advantage of. So if we look at how we're gonna classify the sections, we can first consider axial compression and you can see the compact, non-compact, non-compact slender, those two limits for concrete filled sections up here for rectangular where you're looking at the minimum width thickness ratio and for round HSS where you're looking at the depth to thickness ratio. And I included in the bottom table the same equations except when we're talking about axial compression, you're looking at the boundary between non-slender and slender for hollow sections. And here you can really see the advantage. So if you look at the, the equation for a hollow section, it's 1.4 squared E over Fy, whereas if you look at the equation for the boundary between compact and non-compact for concrete filled, you jump up to 2.26 squared E over Fy. So you, you have a little more to play with there with the concrete filled sections. And the same thing with the round, your coefficient goes from 0.11 to 0.15. And we can look at what that means a little more practically. So what you see here are plots of the depth to thickness ratio versus the width to thickness ratio for all of the square and rectangular hollow structural sections that are in the AISC uh, manual. And on the left, you see a plot for the hollow sections, on the right for the concrete filled, and we're assuming these are all ASTM A500 grade C. So given the limits, the red lines here represent the boundary between slender and non-slender sections. So anything that's covered in the red here is considered a non-slender section. So you can see there's not too many sections, well, there's a good amount of sections, but not less than half of the sections that fall in that region. Whereas it, when you fill that HSS section with concrete and look at the boundary between compact and non-compact, you get much more sections that fall under that compact category. So you have more sections that can actually reach their full plastic capacity. And then if you then look at the boundary between non-compact and slender, you can see we take up almost all of the sections. There's just a few rectangular sections and one square section here. Now the ones on the diagonal here represent the square sections and if you look at this, what it ends up being is for the ASTM A500 grade C uh, square HSS members, there's only four that actually are non-compact and then there's only one that's considered slender. So you can easily avoid these sections if you actually wanted to. Now if we look at round hollow structural sections and round concrete filled hollow structural sections under axial compression, you actually see for the hollow sections, they all are con considered actually slender, and the same thing's true for the concrete filled ones. So the advantages 
Here for axial compression might not be quite as great, at least from a local buckling standpoint. Now we can also consider the slenderness limits in flexure, and again, you can see the advantage here. We're comparing apples to apples in terms of non-compact and compact limits, non-compact and slender. And you can see, again, you have that advantage versus the hollow 1.12 squared E over Fy, and then for the flange of a rectangular HSS, it's 2.26 squared E over Fy. Now, the other thing to keep in mind that I didn't mention with the axial compression, but is also true for the axial compression, is you have a max permitted value here as well. So you can see that max permitted value actually for, at least for the web, is equal to, and for the rounds, is equal to the non-compact slender limit. So for these, you really can't get into the slender section issue. And we can look at this a little more closely with, those, with similar plots. So here again, these are the sections that would be classified as compact for a hollow structural section and non-compact for a hollow structural section. So you can see there's a number that are still here that would be considered slender. Whereas for concrete filled, we got a much larger number that, um, that are considered compact and then almost all of them except for one that are considered non-compact in this case. And we get similar advantages with round hollow structural section. So you can see here, this is for a hollow round um, hollow structural section. You can see the numbers that are compact. And then they're at least all non-compact, but that grows the amount that are actually compact when you fill it with, with the concrete. So in this case, it ends up being that there's only six round concrete filled hollow structural sections that fall in that non-compact category and there's none that are actually slender. All right, so that kind of gives you some of the advantages from the local buckling standpoint in terms of using concrete filled hollow structural sections. Now there's, a no, there's four analysis methods that are given in chapter I in terms of conducting an analysis to get the strength um, of these concrete filled hollow structural sections. So you can use a plastic stress distribution method, you can use a strain compatibility method, elastic stress distribution method, or an effective stress strain method. Now, if you're using the plastic stress distribution method, you're essentially assuming that the section fully plastifies, so it forms a plastic hinge, and you're doing a plastic limit analysis. In order to do this, you're gonna assume a rigid, perfectly plastic uniaxial behavior, where you're reaching Fy in tension and compression with the steel, and you're each reaching Fy in compression, or reaching the maximum strength of the concrete in compression, but assuming that there's no strength of the concrete in tension. And in terms of that maximum stress that you can reach for the in compression and the concrete, that's gonna be taken as 0.85 FC prime for square and rectangular sections, but we actually bump it up a little for round sections to 0.9 FC prime, and that's really due to the increase in the strength of the concrete for rounds due to the beneficial effects that you get from the restraining hoop action associated with the round section and the transverse confinement that that hoop action provides you. So the, some of the assumptions though that you're making in terms of this plastic stress distribution method is that you re, have sufficient strains to reach yield in both the concrete and steel and that local buckling is delayed until after yielding or, or concrete crushing. So in this case, you're really applying this to compact sections. And this is actually the method that's used for AISC's composite design tables. Now for the strain compatibility method, it's a more general method where you're assuming a linear distribution of the strain across the section and putting some limits in terms of the maximum strains that can be seen, such as the maximum concrete compressive strain of 0.003. Now here you're gonna again assume a reasonable uniaxial stress strain behavior, but you, you don't wanna use material properties that explicitly account for local buckling and confinement. And this is really again focused on obtaining the ultimate strength, and because of this approach isn't essentially assuming a plastic dis stress distribution, right? it works for non-compact and slender sections. Another method is the elastic stress distribution method. Here you can determine the nominal strength based on superposition of elastic stresses, assuming a limit state of yielding concrete crushing. This is useful when a plastic stress distribution is not applicable, maybe the case where you have um, kind of a non-traditional section. And if the effective stress strain method 
assumes strain compatibility. This is, again, you're gonna use an effective uniaxial stress strain behavior for the steel and concrete, but in this case, you're gonna actually explicitly account for local buckling yielding interaction in concrete confinement in that uniaxial stress strain behavior. So this gives an alternative approach for non-compact and slender sections, and it's really applicable if you're using a more advanced fiber-based approach for axial force moment strength interaction. So those are the methods that can be used, and we'll, I'll mention really which method that we're looking at as we go through the design requirements that are given in, in chapter I. So we wanna go through each of those requirements for the different types of loadings that we could see on a concrete-filled hollow structural section. So if we look at the nominal strength of a concrete-filled hollow structural section under axial tension, the limit state in this case ends up being yielding, and we're assuming essentially the steel components are what's taking the the uh, attention, and those steel components include the HSS and the reinforcing steel if the reinforcing steel is present. So you can see based on the equations, you get the, the contributions from the HSS member and then the contribution from the reinforcing steel. But the one thing to keep in mind also, if you're looking at the nominal strength and tension, and it's not mentioned in chapter I, is as you get towards the connection region, you may also have to worry about things like net section fracture and block shear. So don't forget about those in terms of looking at uh, the axial tensile capacity. Now, like I said before, for many HSS sections, you end up with sizes where it's not necessarily convenient to put reinforcing steel internal to the tube. So it's common to see that this component goes to zero, in which case you can just go into the AISC manual table table 5-4, which is in the tension section of the manual, and get essentially your capacities directly because it's just the capacity of the hollow structural section itself. Now, if we look at nominal strength and compression, this is based on the summation of the strengths of all the components, the HSS, the concrete, and the reinforcing steel. And again, it's a function of the member slenderness. So the first thing that you need to really figure out is whether you have a compact, non-compact, or slender section so you can reduce the strength based on the member slenderness and account for a reduced strength due to local buckling. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you're dealing with a thinner hollow structural section here, it actually, the walls are too thin to adequately confine the concrete to allow it to get up to 0.85 FC prime or 0.95 FC prime. So you reduce the stress to, to the maximum stress to 0.7 F prime C. So the limitations that we have in terms of using these for compression is the steel must comprise at least 1% of the total cross-section. Well, this is gonna be true for essentially all your concrete-filled hollow structural sections, and this requirement is really out there for other types of composite uh, members. Also, there's, a minim there's no minimum longitudinal reinforcement requirement, and as a result, there's also no minimum uh, transverse reinforcement requirement because you have the hollow structural section they are providing. Um, some confinement. So the general procedure, if you're looking at the nominal strength and compression, is to calculate the zero length strength accounting for the influence of local slenderness, and then consider length effects and end conditions to get the, the nominal strength based on the limit state of flexural buckling. So if we look at a compact section first, we're gonna assume that we're developing yielding in the HSS and the compressive strength of the concrete infill. So we're gonna calculate this piece of n0, the zero length nominal axial strength, and it's essentially gonna be the full plastic strength of the section. So you can see the full plastic strength of the HSS member, Fy A sub S. And then the second component here is the strength of the concrete infill. So C sub two is taken as 0.85 or 0.95 for rectangular around as we discussed earlier. F prime C times A sub C is gonna give you your strength from the concrete. And then the second component here is dealing with the strength of the reinforcing bar, if you have it there, based on a material transformation from steel to concrete. Now, you can see based on these previous equations, you have to calculate the area of the concrete within the hollow structural section. Well, you really have two choices in terms of how you do that and how you go about that. You can take a simplified method where you essentially assume that it's rectangular and don't consider the fact that you have rounded corners, or you can consider the corners 
and account for that in terms of doing that calculation. So what I did here is I took an HSS 12 by 10 by a half, which gives you fairly long walls and a little thinner section, and an HSS 6 by 6 by 5 eighths, where you have shorter walls and thicker sections, and calculated the area of concrete using both methods. And you can see for the simplified method, we're just assuming it's rectangular, you end up with 99 inches squared for that larger member, or 98.79 inches squared if you actually consider the corners. And then as you go to the smaller, thicker member, you get 28.89 for the simplified method, or 28.56 considering the corners. So you can see there's not a large difference there, but the one thing to keep in mind is that maybe if you're close, you can notice if you went with the simplified method that these are all larger. So if you're close in terms of your capacities, you might wanna go back in and do a more rigorous calculation in terms of the, the area of the concrete. Now, if we look at a non-compact section, for these sections under axial compression, we're gonna assume that we develop yielding in the HSS, but we can't confine the concrete infill as a result of the inelasticity that the concrete undergoes in the vol volumetric dilation, which tends to push on the wall of the HSS tube. And as a result, we limit the compressive stress in the concrete to 0.7 F prime C. And what we're gonna do here is, in order to calculate the strength for a non-compact section, we're essentially taking a quadratic interpolation between piece of P, which is our full plastic capacity, and piece of Y, which is essentially our yield capacity there. So in order to calculate piece of Y now, we're looking at Fy A sub S, and the only difference between the previous equation is rather than having 0.85 or 0.95, as the coefficient here, you're using 0.7. And then you can plug that into the, the above equation to get the zero length strength. Now for slender sections, you cannot actually reach yielding in the HSS member, so it's limited from the steel side of things to the critical buckling stress. And again, you also can't confine the concrete, so you're limiting that stress to 0.7 F prime C. So you can see the equation for the zero length stress is F critical AS now for the steel component where you're gonna use either this equation here for rectangular hollow structural sections or this equation here for round sections. And then the concrete side of the equation is actually the same as what we use for non-compact sections. And in this case, the concrete undergoes inelasticity and even more significant volumetric dilation which causes more stress on the HSS walls. So if we take all those zero length nominal compression strengths and plot them with respect to the element slenderness, you end up with a plot that looks like this. So you can see this plot's slightly different than what we see for just a bare steel member where you'd have a linear uh, stress distribution here. Instead, you have the quadratic stress distribution to account for essentially the confinement that you get from the hollow structural section. Now once you have that value, you need to then account for length effects and end condition effects. And we do this essentially the same way that we do with a bare steel section. The only difference is rather than working with stresses, you're working with, uh, with forces at this point. So your two equations should look pretty similar here. The other difference to keep in mind is that your phi sub C value for a concrete filled hollow structural section is gonna be 0.75. Now for these equations, we have to calculate the elastic critical buckling load. So that's gonna require us to calculate pi squared EI over L. In this case, EI, we need to take an effective stiffness value here because to account for the fact that we have the concrete fill. And L sub C allows us to account for essentially the end conditions of the column. So in order to calculate that effective stiffness, you're looking at the stiffness of the HSS member, the stiffness provided by the reinforcement, and then the stiffness provided by the concrete where we account for the effective rigidity of the filled HSS section with the C3 factor. Now this effective stiffness accounts for the composite section rigidity, and it's a slightly different approach than for hollow structural sections because the infill provides a significant contribution to the strength, the concrete inelasticity will occur irregardless of what happens in terms of the buckling load, and the nominal strengths have been really shown to be conservative using this approach um, based on experimental testing that's been done. 
And I did provide here the equations. If you're looking, you have to calculate I sub C. So these equations here that show you I sub C X and I sub C Y. So your moment of inertia for the concrete about the strong and weak axes. These equations actually account for the round corners in the rectangular and square sections. So that gives you kind of some information in terms of calculating that. The other thing though that you have to keep in mind if you're looking at the strength of a concrete filled hollow structural section um, under compression is that you might actually calculate a case where the hollow structural section has a higher compressive strength than the concrete filled hollow structural section. And you might say, well, how is that possible if we're actually accounting for the strength of the concrete? And it really comes down to the fact that the fee factor that we use for the composite section is 0.75, and for the non-composite section, we use 0.9. So because of that, you can actually end up with a case, right, where the hollow section has a higher strength. And in that case, you can use that higher strength from the hollow structural section in terms of the strength of your member, but then you start to run into the question of whether it's actually worthwhile filling it with concrete because you don't necessarily need it from a strength standpoint. So just keep that in mind. There is, AISC does provide some strength tables. These can be found in the AISC design examples document, volume 15. Now we can consider nominal strength and flexure. Again, this is gonna be a function of the member slenderness, whether it's compact, non-compact, or slender. Now the HSS section alone has good torsional rigidity, but then you add the concrete to it and you get further reduction in terms of potential for lateral torsional instability, which is a benefit in terms of looking at lateral bracing requirements. The concrete infill, as we mentioned before, does change the local buckling modes of the steel. But as I mentioned also, the bond failure between the concrete and steel really not, does not limit your moment strength here. So it's not really a disadvantage when you're looking at the, a concrete filled hollow structural section and flexure. Now the general procedure is to again classify the section for local buckling and then calculate the nominal flexural strength. When you're calculating the nominal flexural strength, you're typically gonna neglect variations of stress through the thickness of the flange. You're gonna provide equations either based on a plastic stress distribution method if you're dealing with a compact section or you're gonna use that strain compatibility method for a non-compact or slender concrete section. Now I will say there's less information in chapter I in terms of dealing with flexural capacity in calculating the nominal strength because it's a little more complex. But what it ends up coming down to is if you plot the nominal flexural strength versus the element slenderness ratio, for a compact section, it's pretty straightforward, it's MP. For a non-compact section, we go back to that linear distribution between MP and MY. Pretty similar to the same way that you do it for a bare section, the only difference is how you calculate MP and MY in this case. And then for a slender section, you're looking at that M critical value. And what we'll do is we'll look at the different stress distributions that you can use in order to calculate MP, MY, and M critical. So for a compact section, again, we're gonna assume that we fully plastify the section. So we reach a yield stress in both the tension flange and the compression flange and actually all through the steel cross section of FY. We're gonna assume a uh, uniform stress for the concrete in the compression zone with a maximum value of 0.85 F prime C if it's a rectangular or square section. Then based on this, we can develop our steel forces, which would look something like this, and our concrete forces. We can sum our moments about a point and get MP for that cross section. So AP can be found, there's an equation for AP in the commentary of chapter I in the AISC specification. So you can go about and do these calculations. Alternatively, you can turn to AISC manual table 6-4, which provides information in terms of the compression flexure uh, interaction diagram that you might want to use. And if you go to point B on that interaction diagram, point B represents the fully plastified state. So 0.85 F prime C in terms of the concrete reaching FY here. And then if you go to that table, it'll give you the actual equation for MP if you're looking for it, rather than doing out the equations that I showed based on the stresses on the previous slide. There's a similar um, equation for in table for round 
concrete filled hollow structural sections round become a little more complex because your geometries become a little more complex. You're dealing with semicircles and, and arcs in terms of doing all your calculations and calculating your areas. So it's easy to go into AIC manual table 6-5 and then look for point B and that point represents the equation for MP. Now if you're dealing with a non-compact section, we're still gonna assume that we're yielding the HSS, so we've yielded the tension side, and we've, if we're calculating MY, we've just yielded the outer fiber on the compression side um, of the HSS member. And then we're gonna assume a linear distribution there. And then we're gonna assume a linear stress distribution for the concrete with a maximum value of 0.7 F prime C. So then based on this, you can calculate your steel forces and concrete forces, sum the moments about a point and get your MY value. And again, A sub Y is provided in the um, commentary of chapter I in terms of doing that calculation. Besides that, there is not a whole lot of guidance. There's no specific equations provided in chapter I itself. And then if you go to slender sections, you assume the compression flange is limited by buckling and the concrete again only reaches 0 0.0 F prime C. So you can see we have a max value of F critical for the steel, assume a linear stress distribution to Fy on the tension side, and the concrete stress distribution is the same as previously. So again, it's just a matter of getting your forces. Again, A critical, the equation for that's in the commentary of section I or chapter I of the specification, and you can sum your moments to get that M critical value. But again, keep in mind, there's not a whole lot of sections that fall under this non-compact and, uh, non and slender category, so it may also sometimes behoove you to just avoid these sections if you want to avoid some of these calculations. Now also, for non-compact and slender round sections, there really is no significant guidance provided in chapter I. But also keep in mind, there's only about six sections there that, that fall under round, concrete-filled hollow structural sections that would be considered non-compact, and none of them are considered slender. Now if we look at shear, there's three options that you're given in terms of calculating the nominal strength of a concrete-filled hollow structural section in shear. You can either assume that the shear strength is based on the HSS section alone, the shear strength is based on the reinforced concrete alone, or the shear, is based on, the shear strength is based on the HSS and the reinforcing steel. Now notice that it does not allow us to superimpose the shear strength of the HSS member and the reinforced concrete, right? Essentially there's no research available that justifies superimposing those things. Either you take all the steel, you take just the HSS, all the steel, or all the concrete. So for a rectangular hollow structural section, if you're basing it just on the hollow structural section itself, you're just using chapter G in that approach to calculate the shear yielding or shear buckling capacity. In this case, you're looking at V sub N equals 0.6 FY A sub W C sub V2, where A sub W in this case you can take as two times H times T. And remember that two is there because we have two walls in terms of the, of the web when you're dealing with a hollow structural section. The other thing to keep in mind here is K sub V for this is gonna be equal to five. For a round section, if you're assuming that again the HSS, HSS section is taking all the shear, it's F critical AG over two, where F critical is the larger of these two equations here, but does not need to be taken more than 0.6 F sub Y. Now if you're considering just the concrete portion for, um, the reinforced concrete portion for the shear strength. You're gonna go into ACI 318, calculate your strength, shear strength of the reinforcement and shear strength of the concrete. But remember, for many of the concrete-filled hollow structural sections, you're not gonna have that reinforcing. So this breaks down to essentially just V sub C. And that might not give you enough shear strength. But you can always take the larger of these three methods um, in terms of assuming your strength and shear. Now, if you're going with the third method where you're using the HSS and the reinforcing steel, you're just essentially going to sum from the previous side, what we talked about, and the V sub S value here. 
So the last thing in terms of uh, nominal strength I want to talk about is the interaction when you have both compress compression, axial compression and flexure. In this case, you need to account for the reduction in capacity as a result of the interaction between these two forces. So here again, you're going to utilize the plastic stress distribution method for a compact section, or you're going to use strain compatibility method for a non-compact and slender section. And there's four approaches that are actually possible for this. You can use the interaction equations that are specified in chapter H of the specification, or you can use a piecewise linear interaction, or you can use what's given in AISC Design Guide 6, but keep in mind the stuff developed in AISC Design Guide 6 is mainly based on steel encased, encased in concrete, not necessarily concrete filled sections, and it's based on an earlier version of the specification, although it's still valid in terms of the approach that's taken. And then the last method is the direct interaction method. This really is used for non-compact and slender filled HSS. Now remember also, if you're looking at uh, interaction, you have to worry about the account for stability on the strength side of things. So remember that you need to do an amplified first order analysis, either using Appendix 7 or a second order analysis using Chapter C of the specification. If you're doing using the direct analysis method to, to get the strength of the section, remember, you're going to have to worry about the effective flexural stiffness, which we talked about previously. And for the nominal axial stiffness, you want to sum the elastic axial stiffness of the HSS member and the concrete itself. And then remember to apply the stiffness reduction factors, the 0.64 for flexural stiffness and 0.8 for axial stiffness. All right, so if we look at the first method and assume we have a compact section, so say you want to use specification uh, equation, the equations in the spec chapter H. Here, you're essentially, the only difference that you're doing between what you may have done before with sections that are just steel is you're replacing the P sub C and M sub C with the values that we talked about in terms of the previous slide. So you're accounting for the concrete in the calculation of your axial compressive strength and your flexural strength. So there are advantages with this. This is a, the same interaction equations that you're used to dealing with for beam columns. And they only really require the calculation of the two points, right? The point where you have zero moment and the point that you have zero axial load. The problem with this approach, though, is it tends to be somewhat conservative. And it gets more conservative the amount of load that's taken by your concrete member. So as the concrete strength tends to go up, this approach tends to be more conservative. So if you say take this approach at first and find out that your, your um, member doesn't actually work under this approach, you can actually take one of the other approaches and may still be able to get that member to work. So speaking of one of the alternative approaches was a piecewise linear interaction approach. And this is essentially given in those tables that I mentioned previously when we were talking about MP um, under flexure. So table 6-4 and 6-5 give information in terms of calculating the interaction diagram that you see here, where A represents the point where you have no zero moment, B represents the point where you have zero axial load, point C here represents the location of the neutral axis that gives you the same flexural strength as point B. Point D just represents a point where you have half the axial load of what you have at point C, or half the axial capacity of what you have at point C. And point E here is just somewhat arbitrary to give a better line between point A and point C. And those equations in terms of developing this curve are, like I said, given in table 6-4 and 6-5 for rectangular and square sections and round sections, respectively. So for this piecewise linear interaction, you're essentially calculating the nominal strength interaction curve, but you're not accounting for slenderness effects in terms of doing that calculation. So when you calculate this curve, you're not accounting for slenderness effects. So you need to go back and calculate the slenderness reduction factor, which is just your P sub N over P sub N naught. Remember that P sub N naught is your nominal strength without considering um, length effects. So it's your zero length nominal strength. 
And then what you're going to do is once you calculate that slenderness reduction factor, you're going to multiply that by your axial strength for point A, C, D, and E. You don't have to worry about point B because your axial strength in that case is zero. And then after you do that, you're going to then multiply the axial and flexural capacities by your phi factors, 0.75 for axial and 0.9 for flexure. Now the problem with this is if you go back and look at this curve, what ends up happening is this D point tends to drop down, meaning that D point can fall outside that nominal strength curve, which is then becomes unconservative. So if you want to avoid having to deal with that, what you can do is actually use a simplified piecewise linear interaction where rather than calculating D, you just take the interaction curve and go directly straight down from C to B. You lose some capacity in the section, but again, you don't have to deal with the issues associated with, with point D. So this is what the curve looks like. So the nominal strength without length effects, so this is just using the equations out of the table. Then when you apply the slenderness uh, reduction factor to a, point A, E, C, and D, you end up with this curve here. And then you apply your phi factor or omega factor if you're doing ASD and get these two curves here. Now just to compare this piecewise uh, method versus using the equations from chapter H, here is the equation from chapter H, and you can see that it is conservative compared to this piecewise method which is shown here. So you do gain some benefits for doing those extra calculations associated with the piecewise linear method. Oops. Now for non-compact and slender sections, there is some information in chapter E that deals with this. And it's really been shown that the interaction can vary with the strength ratio, where the strength ratio is a function of the yield strength of the steel component to the compressive strength of the concrete component. And here you go back to using a bilinear curve similar to what you would do for chapter H. But keep in mind that this procedure is really only recommended if your L over D or L over B is less than or equal to 20, and that the columns that are leaning columns or gravity only columns, and that this concrete fill column might be providing stability to you shouldn't have significant axial loads put on them. Because if that's the case, typically what you're gonna do is have to do some further reduction as a result of slenderness effects. So these equations are given in chapter I. You can see they're pretty similar to what it looks like in chapter H. The only difference is you have to calculate the C sub P and C sub M value. There's a table given in terms of that for rectangular round. And again, that C sub SR, the way you calculate it is essentially the steel strength over the, the concrete strength. But again, there's not a whole lot of sections that fall into this category and may be, may be more beneficial in order to just stick with compact sections. Now the other thing that you have to figure out is how you're gonna transfer the load, the external load, into the concrete filled hollow structural section, and then how is it gonna to get to each of the components of the concrete filled hollow structural section? So you can have the external force applied directly to the HSS only, in which case the load has to be transferred to the concrete. It could be applied to the concrete only, in which case you have to transfer load to the hollow structural section, or the external force could be applied concurrently to both, in which case you eventually have to reach some sort of equilibrium across the cross section. Now again, this is where care needs to be taken in terms of shrinkage with the concrete. If you're assuming it's all going into the concrete and have done your calculations that way, but the concrete shrinks and it's all going into the hollow structural section tube, then you might have some issues in terms of the strength of the tube in that region. All right, so in, in order to calculate the forces that need to be transferred from one material to the other, if you have the external force directly to the HSS member, you can calculate the force that needs to go to the concrete based on the equation here. If you have the external force directly uh, applied to the concrete, you can calculate this, the load going into the steel depending on whether it's compact and non-compact or slender based on the equations here. And then if you have concurrent application, you have to calculate which will provide the equilibrium state based on essentially the capacity of the, of the sections.
Now, you should keep in mind that you're not allowed to actually apply a load directly to a steel HSS member that is slender. And the reason for this is you can actually get premature local buckling, and that won't allow the load to actually transfer into the, the concrete portion of the concrete filled HSS member. Now, there's some different ways that you can actually transfer these loads. But keep in mind, you cannot superimpose the transfer mechanism. So you have to pick one and use that one in order to assume that that's how your load's going to be transferred. So you can do this through direct bearing, which, would, which might involve a bearing plate, through shear connections, which might involve steel-headed studs or steel channel anchors within the HSS member, or through direct bond. And that needs to be done over a certain length. So what, we, what you do is you calculate your load transfer region, which is going to be a function of the details of the connection. So say you have a shear tab connection like you have here. Your load transfer region is essentially going to be the length of that shear tab. And then what you're allowed to do in order to get your maximum load introduction length is add to that two times the, the width or the diameter of the concrete filled HSS member, depending on whether you're dealing with a rectangular or a round hollow structural section. And keep in mind though, for concrete filled hollow structural sections, you can only extend that load transfer region by that 2B or 2D in the direction of the applied load. So this is the location where you're gonna put, say those shear studs or a bearing plate or something like that in order to make sure, or you calculate your, um, your bond strength over, over this given length. All right, so now that we've looked at some of the design requirements, we can look at some practical guidance. So some things that you need to keep in mind in terms of if you're, if you're designing and specifying a concrete filled hollow structural section in your structure, care must be taken really when filling the HSS from the top of the member. Because if the concrete falls too far, what you can see is segregation of the concrete components. Or you can see as the concrete's falling, if it hits the HSS wall and the HSS wall is thin enough, you can actually have damage to the HSS wall itself. So as a result of this, it's typically recommended that you don't have concrete fall more than three to five feet. Alternatively, you could pump the concrete in from the bottom. But remember, in that case, if you have some sort of cap plate, you have to provide some vent holes in order to allow that to happen. If you're using reinforcing in, within the HSS member, you need to be careful in terms of selecting your concrete mix design. You have to consider the constructability of the column if rebar is used. Is that rebar going to interfere with your connections? Again, we discussed that a little earlier. And then you need to provide adequate spacing of that rebar in order to place all the concrete or at least consider self-consolidating -con concrete uh, that might be useful there. Also consider the fact that that void may form at the top of the HSS due to concrete shrinkage. So detail that region based on the potential for that occurring and based on how you're assuming that your loads are transferring into the member. And then properly detail uh, the member for fire resistance. Keep in mind that typically as the temperature increases, what's going to happen is your load's going to shed from the steel to the concrete and essentially be held by the concrete. So you need to make sure that that's detailed property, properly to be able to take those loads. Okay, the last thing that I want to cover is, like I said, some of the research that I've been doing looking at some alternatives to concrete fill. And we're really looking at these alternatives for seismic applications where adding concrete fill is gonna add seismic mass to the, to the building. And we're not looking to add seismic mass because then that's gonna add force to the building under earthquake load. So we're looking at something that would be lightweight but would provide the same local buckling resistance um, that a concrete fill does. And what we came across was this fairly stiff polyurethane foam. It's actually a two-part liquid that expands in place, so it works very, very well for a hollow structural section. Also, could also work for retrofit applications because you could just add a small hole, pour it in, it would expand in place and, and, uh, and fill up that section. And we've looked at applications for HSS braces and HSS beams because I've done some work looking at complete HSS column and beam connections, where you have a moment frame that's completely essentially tube-based. 
So for the braces, what we found is that by having the foam fill in there, we're able to increase the ductility of the brace, and we're actually able to make it one or two more cycles before we see fracture in the brace because of the inhibiting of the local buckling where that foam fill is located. So you gain those advantages. We also see a severity of the local buckling decrease with continued cycling that you don't see with, uh, with some empty braces. And it's well known that as HSS sections undergo local buckling and then we cycle those braces, right, we eventually get fracture. So if we can prolong when fracture occurs and potentially also increase the diameter to thickness ratio that's allowable, then we can gain some significant benefits there. Like I said, we're also looking at using it in the plastic hinge of HSS beams. And you can see from the plot here where the black is the, an unfilled beam that's being cycled and uh, the red is a filled beam that's being cycled. What we see is the presence of the foam fill in that area tends to reduce the amount of moment degradation that we see with continued cycling. Which is important because Remember, for a special moment resisting frame, we have to be able to maintain 80% of our plastic moment capacity out to 0 0.04 radians. So again, what we did is based on that, we calibrated some detailed finite element models and then looked at, okay, at what point can we, what level of depth to thickness ratio and width to thickness ratio if we have the foam fill will allow us to reach 80% uh, capacity out to 0 0.04 radians. So essentially what you're looking at here is plots of the moment capacity degradation at 0 0.04. And if you look at that 0.2 line, that would essentially be, give you your depth to thickness and width to thickness limits for a special moment frame. So you can see here for a hollow section, that line goes all the way up to about here for the filled sections with the foam fill. So we have seen some advantages Obviously, these results are fairly preliminary. We're doing some more work into, into looking at, at this a little further. Now, as far as some resources, if you're looking at resources for concrete-filled hall structural sections, obviously the AISC manual. The engineering journal actually has a lot of the work that's been done here in the US and abroad in terms of research on concrete-filled hall structural sections. I suggest taking a look at some of those articles. The design examples that AISC puts out, version 15 has a number of worked out actual designs that you can take a look at that are very good. And the Steel Tube Institute puts out a set of uh, design manuals as well that has some design tables for uh, concrete hollow, hollow structural, concrete filled hollow structural sections. Also be aware that there's a new CDEC design guide that will be coming out probably in a year or so. Um, where the authors are Shaoling Zhao, Jeff Packer, who's actually in the audience, um, Yang Wang, and then myself. And then this is going to deal with concrete-filled structural tubes and concrete-filled double-skin tubes. And it's going to look at not only static loading, but impact loading, blast, seismic, and fire loading. So it would be a fairly comprehensive uh, design guide that's looking at concrete-filled hollow section column members. Here you can see some of the references that I used in order to put together the presentation. If you're interested in these or, or want some further information, feel free to, to email me. And we need to finish up with our assessment questions. So I got a couple of true false questions for you. First being concrete fill in HSS limits local buckling but has no influence on the buckling mode of the section and along the length. So does, um, does it have any influence on the buckling mode? Yes or no? Yes. So this ends up being false. And then when determining the capacity of a concrete filled hollow structural section beam column, length effects do not need to be considered. True or false? False as well, right? The initial Interaction curve doesn't consider it, but you do need to consider them with that uh, slenderness reduction factor. And with that, that concludes the presentation. The all-important PDH code is 66782, and I think we have a minute or two that we can take um, some questions. Are there any online questions? So there's no online questions. Any questions from the audience? <laughs>
Yeah, it'll it'll put some it will support that wall, right? That's normally pretty flexible, so you can gain some advantage of the fact that the concrete fills in there. And that's where I was talking about some of the advantages in terms of the connection. There's other types of connections that maybe you won't get the advantage of, but if you have a a moment a connection where the flexibility of the wall is really inhibiting the strength of that connection, then the concrete fill in there can can improve that in remove some of the potential limit states that you have to worry about. <laughs> so I'm not, fire is not necessarily my, uh, my big area, so I don't have, I don't want to give you an answer that, that that's not really, Correct, but the, the thing that you need to keep in mind is what ends up happening in this case, right? With the steel, as the steel heats up, you're gonna lose capacity of the steel and that load's gonna get shed over to the concrete. So that's where your benefit comes from a fire protection. You have the concrete to be able to take the load that the steel's losing, essentially. You could use essentially all the concrete for that. You're probably not going to get the capacities you need. No, I'm thinking about saying like have a very large Yeah, yeah, the concrete doesn't hurt. I mean, it just it requires you to use a different fee factor. The concrete on the flexural side, it tends not to be as much of an issue because you're getting the actual compressive capacity of the concrete on the compression side in flexure, so, which, which is beneficial. How much compression strength can a, so how much, so there was an online question in terms of the increase in compression strength using a concrete filled hollow structural section. Essentially what you're doing is you're taking advantage of the concrete in that case, although with the 0.75 factor you can have a reduction there as opposed to the 0.9 factor. So it's largely dependent on kind of the size of the section that you're looking at. Any other questions? If not, I think the Higgins lecture is coming up quickly, so that's the last session. Thank you.